Um, this is, it's all working at the back, and can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank you all for coming. It's uh, good of you to come and to, to, to hear this lecture. And also, in particular, I'd like to thank the River and Ray Museum for the work they're doing here, and also for their tremendous interest and, uh, in Piper and in bringing probably the first complete collection of his works as a permanent exhibition. What, what, I'm, I'm, uh, what I'm not going to uh, try and do uh, in this, in this uh, lecture is to compare the style of Piper and Picasso, uh, or, or Picasso and Piper. Um, and I have thought about where, you know, the question of a genius in art. And again, that is not what I'm trying to do here with this lecture. What I am going to try and do in the, is what I could call I is the other approach. Um, Piper as Picasso in terms of aesthetics and the approach to art for perhaps the third, uh, first third of the, of the slides, and for the second uh, third, to look at how innovative Piper was in his work, uh, ending up with a really new element, uh, uh, namely his writings. Um, uh, it has perhaps shocked a number of people to think that Piper, uh, as a writer, but his, his first work, uh, when he was 10 years old in um, 1913, was a book which he illustrated himself. And there have been some 642 different writings of his including republications. I certainly don't know if Piper ever met Picasso, although I do believe Piper met Braque and did travel to Paris on a, uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, the perhaps first quote uh, about Piper's appreciation of Picasso, and I should say that that occurred really as early as in the early 30s. He wrote an article in 1935, um, uh, Picasso belongs where? Um, and said, uh, Picasso is a bad member of a school, either as a pupil or master. His development cannot be seen as progress or as any kind of movement, except a series of hops, skips, and jumps, all executed with great mastery. As a leader, therefore, he is unsatisfactory, exasperating. So, uh, uh, in, 1930, uh, in the 1930s, there was a great debate also whether the Tate should acquire Picasso, and Anthony Blunt, the, the eminent art historian, was very much against Picasso at the time. Piper certainly did uh, review and took over Blunt's uh, position as uh, arts reviewer at The Spectator. But Piper, and there is a new exhibition uh, coming up, I think it opens next week at the Tate Liverpool, in which they are trying to position, and they are positioning Piper as the leader of uh, bringing European modernism to, to, to the UK in the 30s. So Piper continues in his writings, and this is Piper's appreciation in the 30s of, of Picasso. Uh, firstly, there's an interview in, in, uh, by Derek Parker in 1972, and Derek Parker says, and of course there's Picasso, and Piper replies, and of course Picasso, all the time. Oh, there's no doubt about that, really. It was Picasso and Brock and the Cubists who were the guiding light and I think we were all trying to find out where to go on from there, or, or somewhere back. And Mondrian too, of course. He was the guiding, immediate uh, guiding light of complete abstraction, I suppose. The Piper continues, whether or not you think that Picasso as an artist has kept his head in the last few years, with the abstract serious battles going on around him, you must ag agree that he has kept his heart. And we'll see that for Piper, the heart is the perhaps the most important element of art for him. Um, the hop, skips, and jumps, and the different um, uh, periods, Picasso's uh, pink and blue, Piper's abstract, are not so important, but the heart. He actually uh, said when he moved away from abstraction, um, uh, it's the way to the heart, abstract art, and I'll explain later what he means by that, but it is not the heart itself. So he says there are drawings with as much abandon talking about Picasso, and as much grace and control in the abandon as anything he has ever done. Uh, as a matter of fact, the subjects of the new ones are nearly all abandoned, abandoned women or abandoned bulls at bullfights. He takes the breath away. So let's explore what makes a 20th century artist, Piper as Picasso. He's not following Picasso, uh, but he is following the aesthetics. This is a paramat by Piper uh, in, of 1935, um, uh, I think it is. Um, 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 he's actually, at the time, innovating with liner cuts. 
Now, we know Picasso in 1958 to 1963 with his liner cuts actually changed the whole method of doing a liner cut. What Picasso did was instead of a block for each color, which he found too long and too tedious, he, he had the one big block and then for each color he cut away. So, once, uh, so he started from the lightest color and then cut away to the darkest color. Um, by cutting away the block meant that if he made a mistake, the work was no longer any good. So Piper innovated for a different reason. He wanted to reproduce color very cheaply, and he wanted to reproduce Picasso's color very cheaply with the Paramat box. And this is in 1935, almost 20 years before Picasso. And Paramats were rubber-mounted blocks on aluminium, which could be cut away to leave an area in relief to be inked. And they were associated with commercial printers at the time, who, who could use it to achieve dense, flat areas of color, and so each color having its own sort of block. And this was mainly for advertising posters. With this particular one, Piper added a half tone. Um, there is the apocryphal story, I don't know if it's true, that Piper did meet Picasso and he showed him this particular work. And Picasso said, yes, I remember doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Picasso, of course, would be joking, and he's certainly paying Piper a compliment. Just as much as uh, Picasso, when it came to aesthetics, um, had a, a tremendously sharp and intelligent mind. He did say, you have to tell the truth in art, but you tell it slant. And there is the true story that when someone showed him, uh, when someone complained to Picasso about one of his paintings, that it didn't resemble the person uh, doing it at all, and then subsequently showed Picasso a picture of his wife, Picasso said, my, but she's very small. <laughs> so, Let's set out uh, some parameters on principles, um, which Picasso said, art is the lie by which we tell the truth. Piper, I think, said it slightly differently. The right creative act makes its own laws and always will so. So I believe both of them on the left-hand slide have uh, followed the, um, the principles of what I call the first one is a leapness. It's a, lived, a German word for lived experience. We all know about Picasso's tremendously autobiographical nature, and he couldn't create anything. He used to date his works and even time the works, uh, day, date, and month. Um, and it's, it's always based on a lived experience. And I think uh, Piper was exactly the same. For instance, all uh, Piper's nudes, as we'll come to, were of his wife, Mafanwe. It's autobiographical for both of them. They very importantly always work about what they know, not what they see visually. So we'll, get, we'll come to this question of dis distortion. Um, they, there's a rhyme and a rhythm in them. In some of Piper's works, the, uh, the mountain will echo the shape of a, of a human form. Absolutely the same with Picasso. Titles are key for both of them. And um, both of them followed what, I, what uh, Blake talked about, changer la vue. Uh, for Piper, uh, for Picasso, he moved from the classical period uh, when he was doing the, 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 the blue and the, and the pink periods to Cubism. And in fact, people said of him at the time, it's the greatest loss for French art. Um, but he moved. He always changed. Pic uh, Piper moved from abstract to, let me call it classical. Um, and Piper was at the, fo at the forefront of, of abstraction. And um, he caused a lot of uh, hard feelings when he abandoned abstract art to move on to what he called um, other work, which I'll explain. For both of them, all art is cosa mentale, I think, which is, uh, and all great art is cosa mentale. It's mental concepts. It's not visual concepts. It's trying to show and engage with the viewer um, uh, as much as possible to show that lived experience, that leapness, uh, and Re allow the viewer to recreate it. It is said, and I think it's quite correct, that a picture isn't completed until it's completed in the mind of the viewer. So when you look at a work, you should, you should be able to recreate in your mind what the artist was trying to do based on that eliteness and the emotion or the heart. Um, I will come to uh, quotes from his writings uh, on this. 
As far as the type of fields that they worked in, um, I've used the arrow to the left uh, to, to, to indicate Piper and the arrow to the, to the right. Both of them used collage very effectively. There's some very nice collage works upstairs in, in the exhibition. Um, both of them did book illustrations. Picasso slightly differently, he, used, he did what was called the beau livre. He worked with contemporary poets and, and so on and illustrated the work. Um, Piper did tapestries, Picasso not so much. Um, both of the, uh, Piper did mosaics, again Picasso not so much. Both of them did ceramics, again there's some ceramics upstairs. Uh, film work, Piper did some film work and I think I'll I think have it written down later in 1938 and I think it's a television. Television I think only was in, from 1935 onwards and Piper was once one of the first people, I don't know how he managed to persuade I think the BBC at the time to put on a, a, a film about art but in 1938 he was trying to share. Both of them I think are um, very much sharing. The, the, Piper said if anything is a secret it's not worth having. He was extremely giving uh, discussing and in his writings especially so about not only his work but his art. Um, Piper much more than Picasso took photographs so from an earlier age um, from the 19 well, almost from 1920 onwards and most of these can be seen at the Tate I think there's some 5,000 photographs there. Picasso on the hand, other hand did magnificent sculptures. Piper uh, I can't think of any sculptures that he did and then Piper much more in stained glass, Picasso very much not so on. So it's the changing perspectives, all of them, uh, the creative element of both of them, not doing something new for the sake of doing something new, but actually working to, to, to explore new areas. So <laughs> the very famous um, Windsor Castle um, of 1942 and the words of George VI, who once seen it said, you seem to have been very unlucky with the weather, Mr. Piper. <laughs> well, um, the work on the left is the, the very famous Le Damoiselle d'Avignon or Picasso, 1906-1907. Um, and uh, people do see it, see it as uh, uh, an abomination, or the figures on the right are an abomination. We can think about uh, the, the, the crouching figure there, the woman. Uh, nobody would look like that. Um, I wrote a, uh, it's over there, I wrote a long ekphrasis, a uh, sort of poetic um, hymn to this particular work, Picasso, because my research as, uh, in, for the PhD was on Cubism and, 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 and that area. But um, it's all about what I mentioned earlier on, cosa mentale. Um, the Picasso picture, if you, if you think of the five figures as D1 to D5 going across, it's it's, a, it's one, work, one work of womanhood looking at women. It's not five different pictures. It's all concepts of women from different angles and different types. And there are some descriptions uh, from Braque and the others at the time saying, oh, that one reminds me of Ferdinand, that one reminds me of this one, and so on. There is no African art influence at the two figures on the right, although most historians do say that. In my view, and you'll see an African art work later, is it's all to do with African art being also concepts cosa mentale, and Picasso seeing in African art a brotherly art. But it's more difficult when we turn to Piper, because figures or weather or, or so on seem to be, indicate that we can say it is a, perhaps a distortion. Um, Piper himself wrote, on, on this particular, but it seemed to me perfectly natural because you show up rather pale colored buildings in a fleeting sunlight by putting black skies behind them. It seemed to me quite obviously it's all part of what we do with buildings. Um, and it, so it, it's nothing to do with the weather. It's to do, put that aside, what is the picture doing there? What is, Picasso, uh, what is Piper talking about? And Piper writes further, further what you call the law of optics, I call the conventional way of looking at things. And by the way, I don't agree with what you say about medieval artists. The early 19th century painters I've referred to, far from painting the grass green, were more, more likely to paint it burnt to sienna. Turner skies, far from being blue, are just as often yellow, green, orange, dark grey, or all four. 
If I paint a sky black, it is because I see skies very often as black. If not black in themselves, black in relation to pale or startlingly white or strongly lighted buildings. I cannot agree with the suggestion that I paint what I do not see. If my paintings have a non-representational appearance, they have it as a result of the attempt to stress certain characteristics in a scene. Those characteristics that seem to me of importance to that scene. The attempt to obtain not caricature, but character. Picasso said, in order to, for people to see a nose, I had to paint it skew. And you can think of the figure on the right. So I've called this more weather. <laughs> um, the portrait on the left is a picture of Dor Doria Ma. And no one would dream of saying to Picasso, you've been unlucky with your girlfriends. <laughs> But on the right is Stansfield. It's a screen print of 1968. It simply does not exist in the real world in those colors, those backgrounds, or those detailed. Piper loved buildings. Picasso loved women. It is the, there is a true story of Margaret Thatcher, I believe, asking Piper to paint checkers. Piper declined, and if I recall, said something it would be like painting a newborn baby. Far too characterless with its neat lawns, and he did write an, a seminal essay called Pleasing Decay, which is really a wonderful read about, about that. Um, I, I, I also remember reading another uh, uh, letter in my research at the Pipers uh, when a Piper w uh, was asked uh, to do a commission. I think it was. I'm not quite sure if it was ever building it. It was one of the royals who sent it, and the letter was very peevishly complaining to Piper about the rudeness of his secretary, a lady to whom this person, had, this royal, had spoken to, and suggesting that Piper should get a new secretary. And clearly, this person had got to, on the wrong side of Mafanwe, and um, who was really quite a warm and giving lady. But the Pipers weren't interested in doing things or, or uh, trying to get on with people. OK. Um, Piper did love the content, the contours, the shape, the colors, the history, the genius Loki, or as he called it, of buildings. And my fun way Piper put it very well when she wrote, that mysterious magic presence that collects the dreams of the past, which like wasp stings accumulating in the blood, accumulate in the mind and the imagination. Um, Piper goes on to say, uh, about the importance of emotion and feeling, just as Picasso has with his picture there. The spread of a moss on a wall, a pattern of vineyards, or a perspective of hop fields may be the peg, but it is not the hop poles or vineyards or church towers that these pictures are meant to be about, but the emotion, and I stress emotion, generated by them at one moment in one special place. I've enjoyed the fields and stone walls and small hills of southwest Wales and the darker, more insular feeling of the West, and, and so on. So it's, it's all about that. It's all about their personal experience for both of them. There is the story uh, again, and it's not limited to, to um, uh, King of England. The, um, the, um, I remember reading once the principal of uh, St. Edmund's Hall who on retirement was given a piper which contained some red in it of the, of the courtyard. And he was quite um, angry about it. Was, it. was it called the view from the senior common room? He said, if I saw the quad looking like that, I would call the fire brigade. <laughs> it, it's not the reason why Piper uses things. So uh, I, I think um, before I go on to this work, I, I, I would like to, 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 to perhaps end off about the importance of Piper in relation to Picasso, or as Picasso, about the, the modernism and why Piper has been perhaps so uh, misunderstood. There's a, an important book uh, which came out in uh, 1981 uh, by Charles Harrison called English Art and Modernism from 1900 to 1939, who describes Piper as an insular and conservative tembassy, and those responsible for this reaction were critics and artists like the Pipers, who ex ex experienced such an elaboration, 
insularization as a threat to their own professional self-image and to the essentially superficial view of artistic practice. Um, it's all wrong. I mean, even as recent as 2016, there's an excellent book on Piper by David Fraser Jenkins, and a reviewer pompously rather termed Piper the first Brexiteer. It's absolute nonsense. Piper was anything but, and it is really painful to see such misjudgment, but we cannot escape calmly even in the grave. So, changer la vue um, is, is really important. This is a picture called Three Bases by the Sea, 1934, and again, Piper is using collage on gouache on, 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 on card. It's in Pallant House. He's absolutely got a clear understanding of modernism and in particular cubism. Mm -hmm. It could be considered, although it is very different, to Picasso and the separation of line and color. Um, same, same sort of things. And if we look, and I hope this works, Over there is the collage, and Piper's sense of humor, it's, it's, a, it's a label from a tobacco label, and the tobacco label is called Fine, the company making it is called Fine Shag. <laughs> but I, I'm not too sure if Piper is already, uh, the very thick lines very different to Picasso, um, whether he's thinking of stained glass and his influence of stained glass, because in stained glass you would have the, the board rings there. It, it is a, a, a mental uh, work. It is it's all about being on the seaside and, and the, the feelings that are evoked by that. Um, there is, uh, in, in Cubism, Juan Gris, one of the four important Cubist uh, painters who came to Collage, um, wanted to paint a mirror or put a mirror into his picture and then actually cut a, a piece of a real mirror and struck it on uh, because he said, that, that is the essence of a mirror. It reflects what in, is in front of you, and he couldn't do it. So both Picasso and, and, and Piper try and get to the essence of what they are trying to do. Um, we have two, two works here, the, on the, uh, the Corbels at Kilpeck, 11th century um, work, in which Piper did a graphic of it. And again, like Picasso showed us perhaps the newness of everyday objects such as um, cups, saucers, the guitar, and uh, iconography there. Piper is showing us, uh, and is the first about the Anglo-Saxon 11th century, almost Romanesque works, how important it was. He, he certainly wrote an article on it, and here he is trying to show, again, in this, in, this, in this graphic, all the different elements that make up the essence of Kilpeck. Um, both of them show us something new, in everyday objects around us. Um, Piper building and the church, Picasso, something else. The, the, the one on the right is a, it's called a Sheila Nagig. Um, it's a, it's a well-known fertility symbol. And, um, but it's not limited to uh, Anglo-Saxon. On, this is a Dogon mask, again, um, Causa mentale, even in what is pejoratively termed primitive art, a term hopefully no longer used. Pr uh, African art can and is as sophisticated, and certainly the Dogon tribe, as anything in Western art. Again, um, concepts uh, and, and so on. And going back even 500 years before uh, Christ, again, this is a drinking cup in the Ashmolean. It's called a calyx grant. It's a shallow drinking cup. Uh, the designs painted on the left would be covered by wine. When it is drained, it would reveal, be revealed a bit by bit. Again, the artist having in mind to play with the element of uncovering and concepts of art. It's simply not decoration. And I'm hoping this is giving a flavor <coughs> of Piper as Picasso at certain key elements between the two of them. What is great art, and which is not limited to Western art at all, but uh, art of uh, 500 years before the Common Era, but also African art. Unfortunately, this slide um, isn't very good, so I'm going to discuss three works of Piper. This is a Sheffield. It's in a private collection, and I haven't been able to get. It's a Sheff Sheffield Cathedral. But what Piper has done very much is he's... That's the exterior, if you can't really see it, but he's painted the exterior of the, of the cathedral, 
and in red he's put in the interior of the cathedral. So um, again, if we think of cubism with showing multiple views of the same subject from the top or the bottom, Piper is trying to do the same there. This is a screen print, as I mentioned, uh, of Piper's nudes, um, uh, the Iron Camera series in which he did it. It's all based on Mafanwe. And if you look at just this work, one could almost debate that whether it wouldn't be a, a, a Picasso-like uh, abstraction or running figure or whatever it is. But he's abstracted from that to that. Um, he's, again, using all modern techniques, separating line and color, um, He's chosen a warm burgundy color, both as the background and in the lines, association with wine, blood and warmth. And um, this detail on the right-hand side is he's using collage and marbling paper to give that, in which he's, again, absolutely put in there as much or as many modern elements uh, as you would find in any Picasso. Uh, this particular work is actually on the exhibition upstairs. Again, um, Piper, it's from 1939. It's, it's two aquitans from the, the um, uh, Brighton uh, uh, aquitans. I actually have the book there if anybody would like to have a look at it afterwards. But in 1939, Piper, Piper is innovating as much as Picasso innovated with using newspapers to come in. Piper is using newspapers to create the brickwork of the particular building. Um, uh, it's certainly autobiographical. And in this particular work here, which is um, Piper has, a bit like Picasso, he's scratched to get the feeling of rain. He's actually scratched on the plate, and which, had he got it wrong, would, of course, ruin the plate. Um, and whether one looks at that and thinks of the the sea or reflection and so on. It's just a very modern work and for something round about 1939. We have uh, upstairs as well. Uh, again, Piper as Picasso, just to show his, his careful attention to detail, is the Billy Budd Opera, where he made the sets himself um, with Mufanwe, with some helpers, to, to get a very, very good uh, view. And upstairs is also a backdrop of a particular w uh, work, as well as some sets. Costume designs, we know Picasso designed costumes as well. Piper, as innovative and as interesting uh, as well. Um, on the left is the set design for the rape of L L Lucretia. And the right is the stained glass design and again, perhaps going a little bit more into the element of the mental approach, or this is the, uh, on the right-hand one, this is the symbol, symbols of the stigmata. And um, you have a heart across vivid colors and so on. Um, but he's created new lines and emblems, so the, the heart becomes almost hugely enlarged and distorted, if you like, it's the, and the, the human figure is... is is not a human figure, but clearly a human figure, uh, very much uh, like with Picasso's changing of, of faces, the, uh, and so on, using not real, but more real than real, if I can put it that way. The, the dark holes there are heart shapes as well, uh, um, uh, and they're resolved, and they point in many directions, and the green shoots with their leaves echo the blood, river, blood red flower seeping from the wounds. The shoots are both the crown and the central upright figure and outstretched multiple finger leaves. So again, um, very different uh, to, to the norm in England, but very much like Picasso's work, that he's enriching and working to a bigger, a bigger view, that genius Loki that I mentioned earlier on. Um, Piper puts it in a way, he says, having, regard, having prepared my canvas, I begin to paint, and you will see the picture grow stage by stage. It will be obvious as I go on that I'm not following the actual landscape. He's talking about landscapes there, um, or my drawing of it, but rearranging things quite a lot so as to make an elaborate symbol of the place, not a view, but a history. 
and we can think again exactly what Picasso has been doing with the La Damoiselle d'Avignon. Um, a photograph, a very early photograph of Piper and some ceramics, although we do have ceramics. So in whichever field he went, as much as Picasso did, very much accomplished, very accurate, and so on. If we turn to his writings, which is perhaps a new element, and uh, quite different to, 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 to Picasso, it's true that artists have always written, and, they are, and their writings are very exciting to read. We have Delacroix as a critic, Van Gogh as a man of letters, Blake with his aphorisms, Kandinsky with his theories of art, Michelangelo with his poems, and Picasso with her play and conversations. But Piper is very different. It's absolutely, he is very, very prolific. Uh, he was first a writer, as I mentioned, and um, I don't think time allows me to discuss his writings in detail, uh, but he, he writes on craft, abstract, romanticism, stained glass, Romanesque sculpture, his reviews, art, artists, the death penalty, marijuana, the Royal Academy, and I'll come back to that, unemployment, he, uh, publishing music, literature, poetry, and so on. And there's some very seminal works as well, very important. So um, a huge breadth in subject and in style. What uh, very much like his paintings and perhaps like Picasso, there's no repetition. He's not um, uh, repeating himself um, and trying to, to, to um, uh, just change the title or anything like that. Always a personal con uh, uh, involvement and always uh, not trying to be clever, expressing himself. And he's true and honest and always trying to generate an emotional response. So if I turn to some unique elements of his writings, um, um, that is page 147. Um, he's not afraid to say, he was asked in 1935, and um, Mr. Hilton says, the interviewer, there's some poor stuff in art galleries then, Piper, of course. I've seen pictures on the flagstones by pavement artists much better than some pictures in the National Gallery. Hilton, you serious? Piper, quite serious. Hilton, some pictures done by pavement artists are better than some in the National Gallery. Piper, much better. But he explains himself and he says, and this is this particular quote over there, and the way to polish professionalism is probably by way of hundreds of little neuroses and persecutions, because an artist designer's life is not a dressing up game, not a matter of rubbing up a talent till it shines, not even, as most people think, getting better and better in your particular line. It is rather a constant stalking and killing of one's old self and the most successful for performance will be a sum of destructions, as Picasso said of a painting. Always wanting to renew. Uh, this particular quote, which uh, is, is, is quite important as well, um, is, he writes, it's, a, it's from a poem of a gaudy saint, and the there's a book, a copy of it upstairs as well. And he says, and I quote, ugly the saint is, rudely done, and yet he shines as a setting sun on a barren landscape, shedding grace on the cold gray church's cold gray face. Why is it he shines with such crude colors and such crude lines? By seeking God's will, not their own. And the quote is poetic, but it it's also shows that Piper is not concerned, like Picasso, with external appearance. Um, crude <coughs> colors, crude lines, so long as it has a humility, not God's will, not their own. It has a, 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 a ring of truth and a ring of authenticity. Um, so the unique element, so there are catalog notes, panel discussions, forwards, interviews, introductions, letters, lectures, obituaries, prefaces, and so on, and spanning really longer than his painting. And like a good cubist, he, uh, his writings show us the man, 
his thoughts, his aesthetics, and the zeitgeist from many angles. Uh, key themes, abstract, what it is to be a romantic, and he explains these all very well. He certainly opens our eyes to new beauty, Welsh chapels, English early sculptors, roofscapes, he was the first person to use that term to show the beauty of roofs, and um, the, the creative poet uh, process as well. And it is unflinching honesty, as Picasso's is, and the very many varied elements in his writings is not because Piper wants to be new, clever, or different, as Picasso didn't want to be, but because his heart and mind are extraordinary travelers in the pursuit of enriching his own technique and life. It really is the life of a pioneer, a hallmark of the good 20th century artist, whether it's a writer or a painter. Picasso was a pioneer, and as free and exploring, not afraid to abandon old visions, and in looking, he finds the joy in discovering new, same as Piper. <coughs> so, on abstract painting, um, I'll go to some of this, to give you an idea of how his writings didn't repeat itself. I probably can't read it uh, very much. Um, for, but in all of his writings, he talks about it slightly different. Ab abstraction is a, but all of them will point to what he means by abstraction. Abstraction is a luxury, yet some painters today indulge in it as if it was the bread of life. The early Christian sculptors, wall painters, and glass painters had a sensible attitude toward abstraction. However hard one tries, and many attempts, one cannot catch them out in indulging in pure abstraction. The abstraction, such as it is, always is subservient to an end, the Christian end that it happens. And for Piper, as he said, it was the way to, to, to the heart, not the heart itself. Um, or as he put it, abstract painting is like a man going for a walk for the sake of his health. Um, the value of abstract painting to me and the value of surrealist painting to me are paradoxically, if you would like, they are classical exercises, not romantic expressions. They are a discipline, even dreams can be disciplinarian, which open a road to one's heart, but they are not the heart itself. I doubt if under their complete domination one masterpiece will ever be created. After an abstract period, what a relief one feels. The avenue at Stathampton or the watercress beds at Hume are seen with such new intensity. And, and so he goes on. He says, um, and the waterfall, uh, um, the, so that those posts into, are areas of color and the waterfall into the watercress bed becomes like a bend relief, um, Ben Nicholson is thought, then the results can be hung perhaps in Cork Street, but not hung against, against one's heart. Um, very, very uh, personal, very, very intense. Uh, in this wonderful letter to, to, to Paul Nash, um, um, Piper writes, um, and, the, and the point about it is he's again showing, uh, like Picasso, there's no dichotomy between his exterior world and his interior world, between his public face and his private face. Um, firstly, he says, um, Never, sh never should I write you off as ungracious, as you unwarrantly suggest. I might in the nearest to an ungracious suggestion I've ever had from you. And meanwhile, I'm distressed by your new, and he talks about that, uh, and he talks about constable and, and the world is wide and no. To me, dreams are not as romantic as bits of a real experience. To me, similarly, Ernest, uh, Ernst Daly, you at your most serious, are not ever as romantic as Ruart Bruck, uh, and so on. And he says, I don't care what Herbert Reed may say or all the boys with double-barreled foreign names and addresses in St. John Wood. The value of abstract painting to me, and so on, and then that quote uh, I've mentioned. Um, and he, he really does show how he thinks about things. And he says, and he ends off, please, don't please feel that this letter is a thing that ought to be answered. It is not. I like your letter and not less because I disagree with nearly all of it. <laughs> My disagreement will not prevent me from brooding over the remarks and I hope profiting from them. And, and that is Piper as much as Picasso. So 
people sometimes wonder why Piper has not been as uh, well known or as appreciated as Picasso. And I, I think there are, there are many reasons, but part of them is because as a reviewer, um, I'll just find these pages, um, he, he was extremely honest and extremely critical. So Cecil Beaton wrote a book um, sorry, in 19, um, and published it called um, The Book of Beauty, 1931. Um, and Beaton was very popular and very well known and very well connected. And Piper was, it's the most scathing review I've ever read of, of anything. Um, there's no denying the importance of the Victorian Books of Beauty as an institution. Presumably, Mr. Beaton's 20th century counterpart will per peruse in 2030. And whether with sniffs or with whoops or joy does not very matter much. It will be out of date six months from now. And it cannot possibly be fashionable again, at least for 100 years. And he goes on to say, full page photographs of Mr. Beaton in some of our more pictorially inclined contemporaries have often in the past been intriguing for the, for the moment, somewhat in the manner that a brand new cocktail or a really chic savory might intrigue. But by pu publishing such a large collection of these repellently captivating bumbush, he has denied us even the pleasure from them in the future. For it is impossible to dabble, let alone paddle, wade, or swim inside these immoral spotted covers without nausea. And having experienced this nausea, half-brother for five minutes or so to rollicking good humor, the temptation of suggesting its quality to others is irresistible. Um, and there's more, much more. Um, <laughs> so Piper was honest, absolutely honest, as much as Picasso. And, uh, but it, it caused a lot of problems, I think, for him. Um, Beaton never forgave him, of course, and um, I think uh, Beaton was very friendly with institutions and collections. But in 1945, Piper writes about an exhibition at the Royal Academy and says, the Royal Academy this year, as for many years, does not give us one new truth and gives us all the old falsehoods. And again, he deals with it very clearly. He goes through each of the artists and explains it very carefully. When it came to architects who were perhaps not up to standard because he had to review them, he wrote about a particular architect's work. It's pretentious rather than original or successful. No doubt it shows an attempt on the architect's part to think in an impressive personal style, but he surely thought too much and felt too little. And he goes on to say, before the present war began, our architects were experimenting, the better ones with new materials, the worst ones with old styles. Uh, there are many, many uh, reviews, uh, artists, and so on. And it's not Piper being uh, catty or bitter or, or anything like that. He certainly praises Jack B. Yeats in the 30s, Lucian Freud in the early 40s, Francis Bacon in the 40s, Picasso, as we know, in the 30s, well before anybody else. So a, a very perceptive eye. But I cannot imagine the Royal Academy ever offering him anything. Uh, and in fact, I can't imagine architects offering him anything after his uh, reviews. As a, as a writer, he was scathing of a book by Fiden, and rightly so, I've seen the book. Um, and we see many of these types of books coming out today. Uh, so um, the book by Fiden, and uh, a very important publishing house, well, may we ask why the first of these two new Feynman volumes has been published. It presents 142 reproductions of drawings finely printed, well over 100 which may have been slenderest, which have the slenderest beauty and interest, less than the drawings of any respectable English artist of the 19th century. And he goes on, such, uh, the best drawings reproduced is a slight sketch by Elsenheimer, which only appear, appears because, quote, it may have been the origin of the works by Rembrandt. And he ends off by saying, this surely is connoisseur connoisseurship at its worst. Uh, you could, and Mafanwe said what attracted her to, to, to John when she hadn't known him, was his style of writing and his honesty and integrity. So, uh, there are the aphorisms of Piper um, uh, in many of his writings. 
Uh, very similar, in a, I feel, in a way, uh, sorry, there is more, but I realize we're coming close to the end and I want to leave some time for questions. Um, the trouble is to keep up a really interested feeling for your subject and painting, letting one play off against the other. Sometimes it seems to me that the ability to do this constitutes the whole of the art. Nothing pretentious, nothing uh, difficult to understand. Um, he's, uh, we've, I've done the one quote, the art is minor when it is mediocre. When it's first class, it is major like any other art, but major or minor, it always involves a, a, a craft as well. Uh, the steam rollership of scholarship, without flat flattening every trace of enthusiasm, we can remember what he said about pavement artists and the uh, National Gallery. And his remedy, this is, is not education, not the amassing of more and more and write effects only, but infuse, informed enthusiasm, which I hope was why you're all here, <laughs> <laughs> and the use of the eye. Um, uh, make, uh, and, and, and so on. I think the clothing thought, thoughts that I would have, um, this interesting feeling for your subject and painting. I think Piper, like Picasso, will pass the test that all art has to undergo. Um, it's a capability of emerging with its value enhanced from any period of obscurity. And I think that is certainly what is happening now with Piper, or has been happening to an extent over the last few years with the, the, the permanent exhibition here at this museum and now the Tate Liverpool for the first time really bringing in Piper as an important conduit of, of 20th century art. Taste has plunged Piper into something which has been provincial as, it, as they termed. It is very a derogatory term. Um, there is also, I think, an English disdain. Piper has been turned a jack of all trades. Picasso, of course, is termed a genius when he comes to various uh, abilities to work in those very many fields, and Piper has worked in just as many. I think one can say about Piper, he, he really isn't a sham, and he's not a jack of all trades, or he is a jack of all trades only to fools. He's certainly a dangerous enemy of academics and schools and officials, was and still is so. He's versatile, competent, <coughs> intelligent, knowledgeable, and honest to his heart in particular, and to in creeping, in, and keeping an interest in his work. He really is the ideal 20th century artist, uh, not just a Renaissance artist, as much as Picasso. And I, I, I do think that as much as you uh, uh, enjoy his work, um, I've been asked also to mention something about the Piper book, which is there, and I think you've got something there. I can certainly talk to you about it. It, 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 is, it is, I think, 3,700 pages long, over 10 volumes. But... Um, there are one-page articles, and they are very, very worthwhile in reading, very worthwhile and interesting. Anyway, uh, I haven't gone through everything that I wanted to talk about, <laughs> but I hope I've given you some indication of why I think um, the two can be equated in their own different ways. Thank you.